Thanks, Brian, for the introduction. And I just wanted to mention that I'm really enjoying the presentations that we've seen to date. And I'm hoping Logan and I can keep up this fine new tradition of good presentations. Uh, so with uh, the, the Alberta Forest uh, Provincial Growth and Yield Initiative, I just wanted to give a, like, a, like a nutshell description of the initiative for folks who aren't familiar with it. Basically, in a nutshell, it's a bunch of PSP data that have been collected from across Alberta, put into a centralized database, and the intended use is for growth model development. It sounds really simple, but this is definitely a case of where the devil is in the details. And the overall objective is better data creates better models, and that creates better forest management decision making. I noticed in the attendee list that there's a few folks that are not from Alberta, so I want to give just a tiny bit of Alberta context to this project. So in Alberta, uh, the, the, the majority of Alberta's working forests is divided into area-based tenures, which are referred to as forest management agreement areas, and that's the map you're seeing on your right here. So each forest management agreement area is required to have its own, what we call a growth and yield program. And the primary driver for having a growth and yield program is to collect enough plots that you can create yield estimates to represent that FMA area and to monitor those yield assumptions. And each company does it in their own way with a combination of temporary and permanent sample plots that they collect. A secondary goal for the growth and yield, or for uh, the growth and yield program is to collect PSP data for growth model development. And growth models are quite important in Alberta. We've got uh, an increased use of growth models for the creation of yield estimates across the province. And growth models are also used in assessing reforestation and success through the reforestation standard of Alberta. But that historic focus that has been at that FMA level uh, means that each company has been really focused on collecting data for the needs of their own FMAs. They have their own protocols, their own sampling methods, and their own specific designs. And what that's resulted in is basically each FMA has their own sort of self-sufficient domain that they focus their data collection activities on. But for the purposes of growth model development, really growth models are developed more at a provincial level. So it's, a, you know, a, a data collection endeavor really needs to be more at a, at a regional level where the plots are intended to capture that range of conditions that we're trying to model. So there was an opportunity that was identified where we could potentially increase the amount of PSP data that were available for growth modelers uh, while reducing the overall cost for companies who would be collecting those data through a collaborative effort. So that is the sort of starting point for the PIGI initiative. So as stated here, the objective of PIGI is to collectively obtain data on tree growth through repeated measurements of PSPs in order to develop, calibrate, and validate growth models both for the purposes of yield estimation and for that reforestation uh, assessment process. In terms of a starting point, uh, the PIGI initiative started about 2014, and it was under the initial um, uh, domain of the Alberta Forest Growth Organization, which has since rolled under the FRO umbrella. All 20 FMA holders in the province are participants in PIGI, and the government of Alberta is a participant as well. So when we first started out, we, we sort of sat down and took a look at what we had and what we could put together in terms of a collaborative program. And we realized that every company has their own plot design. They have their own minimum plot sizes that they're using or the way that they nest plots, their own thresholds for tag, defining what a tree is or what a sapling is, their own specific measurement protocols, methods of data storage, data formats, field names, unique values that they use to define those fields. Um, and as well, different levels of, of information that they record in terms of information about the plot, information about treatment or disturbance information. And on top of all that, each company had a varying ability to contribute data to this program because some companies had been in place for, you know, several decades. They had hundreds, if not thousands of plots that they could contribute, whereas other companies were really just starting out on a program. So we started from a point of quite a bit of variability, and that did create some challenges for this PIGI initiative. And, and I've defined sort of the key factors that I think we needed to address in order to achieve success. So first and foremost, the data need to be available. This sounds like a pretty obvious uh, question. How do we provide incentive for companies to contribute data to PIGI? So of course, the, you know, the, the cost savings is definitely a factor, but we need to ensure that companies were committed to, to contributing data uh, by creating equity and contribution. So those, those companies that had 600 plots wouldn't be carrying the effort of the program relative to a com company that had fewer plots. The second challenge was making sure that the data were accessible. So when you think about it, that's great that 20 companies in the government are contributing data. Let's put them in 20 zip files and stick them in a folder 
and the growth modelers can use that when they're, they're doing their growth modeling. But the fact of the matter is those data aren't accessible. There's a lot of work then to compile and, and use those data. So there needed to be a process for standardized formatting to enable the, uh, the ease of use of those data. And to support that, there needed to be a platform for data loading and storage. The third challenge was ensuring that the data were understandable. So you've got data in a standardized format, but now the modeler has 20 different field manuals that describe the protocols they use to collect the data. So what we needed to do was make sure that the, the database itself captured those elements of the sampling design and protocols that would enable the analyst to use the data without having to refer to those background materials in order to understand it. The fourth challenge was making the data usable. So you've got standardized formatting, the, the protocols are well described, but there's still that old garbage in, garbage out. So we needed to make sure that the data are submit, that it were submitted were of robust quality, and also that any kind of conversion routines that were used to standardize the data didn't impact the quality of the data in any manner. And last, uh, last but not least, is the data needed to be relevant. So are we collecting the right information that are needed by the modelers? And are we doing so in a consistent way across companies so that there's you know, a minimum of data that the modelers need that, that, that they're receiving? The solution to this question came through basically three pieces of a puzzle. So the first piece of the puzzle is, is creating this collaborative program that is PIGI. So through the collaborative program, each company is responsible for their data contributions. They're allocated a target data contribution, and the companies are then um, provided with access to that shared data set. So if one company contributes 30 plots and another company contributes 40 plots, both companies would have access to the shared 70 plot data set. The target responsibility for each company would be proportional to some metric of that company's size. So, you know, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the, the other thing is, is that we didn't want these, these shared contributions, which, which were really necessary, I think, to make this an equitable allocation. We didn't want that to be the only data that ended up in the database because there were companies that had much more data available than maybe their con individual contribution would be. So there was a process put in place to encourage voluntary submissions of additional data, and those data would be restricted for use um, by the modelers only. So companies wouldn't be sharing um, more data than other companies and creating an, an inequitable situation where other companies would then get the benefit of those data. So really it's, it's focused around um, creating a process where folks can share data and, and feel comfortable with the level that they're sharing. The second piece of the puzzle was a very purposive and well thought out design uh, and development of a system of documentation for the PIGI program. So there's actually a, quite a comprehensive guide to participation in the PIGI program. There's three pieces that are very important within that guide. The first is a definition of minimum data standards for contribution. So a company that is com contributing a plot has to meet those minimum data standards in order for that plot to be acceptable. And that ensures that we're focused on um, making sure that, that the right data are being collected that the modelers need. The second is a defined data structure. And of course, you know, storing the trees and trees measurement data, that's important in a standardized way, but that data structure also needs to define key metrics around the protocols that are necessary um, for the analyst to understand the data that they're looking at, minimum tagging limits, minimum plot sizes, that type of thing, as well as data on treatment and disturbance information so that, that the analysts can understand better what went on in that plot over time. And the third piece to that is the guidelines for data conversion. So there were a few folks that were involved in some early tests of the technical implementation of PIGI. And we realized early on that there's a few places where folks could either do things a few different ways or where there were mistakes that could be made or, or where there was lack of, of clarity and clarity was needed. And so some, some sort of best practices for data conversion were needed to ensure that there was consistency in how the data were reported into PIGI. And the third puzzle piece, and this is what Logan will be talking about uh, shortly, is the PIGI database. So we needed a really good database that would ensure that we've got good data controls and ensure that we've got robust data. So the companies are responsible for the data conversion piece. And then the PIGI database um, is available for the submissions that includes uploading of data and validating of data. And there's also mechanisms in place for reporting on submissions in terms of um, the status of submissions, data quality, and some sort of graphical pieces for, for visual analysis. 
And I'd just like to go into, I guess, a couple couple of items that I, I, I consider to be key strengths of Piggy. So the first is efficient allocation. When we set up Piggy, there was a target set for natural stands. So we were targeting 900 PSPs and a target set for managed stands of 1,204 PSPs. So that, that target was then allocated. Each company was assigned a responsibility for the number of plots that they were to contribute. And that responsibility was determined based on their long run sustained yield average. So a company that was in a higher LERSI class would be responsible for reporting plots. And again, that was the focus was on creating some sort of equity um, between contributors. Then once each company was assigned their responsibility, that they were then sort of, there was an allocation that was, that was assigned based on the representation of species composition on each company's FMA area, as well as representation of natural subregions. So a company that has to report 75 plots and they have a lot of hardwood in their area and that hardwood is in the central mixed woods, they would be responsible for establishing more hardwood plots in the central mixed woods. And the leveraging comes in because companies could then use their existing plots to meet those commitments. And with doing that, we were able to capture plots that, you know, we've got plots in Alberta that were established in the in 1960 um, that have, we have up to 10 measurements in the database. So there's a huge leveraging that, that's, that's available by reusing those existing plots. And then there was additional leveraging in, in the fact that once these sort of target allocations were created for each company, um, we did a little bit of, I would call it horse trading, to um, adjust those allocations to minimize the number of new plots that a company would have to establish. So if you've got a company that is short a few central mixed wood hardwood plots, and there's another company that has additional hardwood um, central mixed wood plots, then maybe they would swap those and maybe the other company would then assume responsibility for some white spruce plots, something like that. So that's one of the strengths of Piggy. And the other strength of Piggy is uh, the shared responsibility aspect. So, so each company has a, a shared um, responsibility uh, in so far as that the plot must meet the minimum standards or be upgraded at the next measurement. So what we, what we essentially did is we tried to minimize the impacts to things like we didn't want companies to be changing their their plot sizes or their minimum tagging limits because we know that has ripple effects into how the data look over the next subsequent measurements. But the, 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 the desire to have these upgrade to meet some minimum standards had impacts more on the scale of adding in tagged regeneration at your next measurement, undertaking ecocide assessment or measuring tree ages, that, that kind of scale. The other uh, aspects of the shared responsibility include common commitment to timelines for establishing new plots to meet the targets. So I have a target of about 2,100 plots that we're trying to hit. Um, the, the outstanding plots are, I think, about uh, on the scale of about 800. Those new establishments are due in 2025, which for any of you who are participants, that means you have four years to get those in, hint. Um, and also, you know, there's commitments to the re remeasurement frequency interval. So each company has to remeasure on a minimum of five to year, 10 years based on the stand age or the type of stand that they're sampling. And each company is responsible for the data conversion and reporting of their data into Piggy. In addition to that, there's a subcommittee that's comprised of Piggy members that represents the interest of the full membership and also guides the ongoing development of the Piggy program. Whoops, apologies. So how do you how do you leverage data like you mean it? The first thing you do is you capture your existing data. So in our database now, we have close to 1,400 plots out of our 2,100 plot target. So in the six years since the inception of Piggy, we have 6,500 measurements in our database. You minimize the new data needs that you have for establishments. So by adjusting those allocations across companies to minimize the number of pl new plots that are needed, we've created some, some efficiencies in terms of leveraging data we already have in place and minimizing costs for companies. And thirdly, we facilitate the submission of voluntary data. So by the time companies have their process developed in terms of reporting into Piggy, the process is, is automated and it makes it really easy to then convert any other data you have at the time and contribute those in a voluntary fashion. And just through that process alone, we've got an additional 11,000 measurements in the Piggy database. All right, and uh, just a, a few additional comments on Piggy. So I think Piggy's a really good example of where collaboration has substantial benefits for all parties involved. So 
companies are spending less, you know, investing less money in the in measuring PSP data while gaining an access to a larger PSP database. The growth modelers who tended to not use company data because they were in this variety of formats and took so, so long to kind of understand the data that they would walk by the company data. So the growth modelers are now getting access to a, a much larger data set. Um, and I've got this in quotes, the simple step of standardizing the data instantly makes more data available to growth modelers. Um, it's not a simple step. So standardizing the data for companies when they're first setting it up is, is a little bit painful, I'll be frank, but once it is set up, it's really simple in terms of uh, subsequent conversions because it is an automated process. And we see that in the voluntary measurements that we've seen submitted to date. Just want to take a little sidestep and show a graph that I found out of Forbes magazine um, because this is this kind of illustrates one of the key benefits of, of the Provincial Growth, Growth and Yield Initiative. And that is that about 80% of analytical time is spent on collecting data sets and cleaning and organizing data. So through this program, what we're doing is the companies who are the folks that know their data best are doing that upfront conversion for the modelers. And so the data is being converted is putting it into a very digestible format and it is creating huge efficiencies for, for users on the back end. And so I, I just want to emphasize that's one, that's one of the greatest contributions of, of Piggy. There are a few challenges that remain. So there's a lack of age data that we've noticed. We've been doing a bit of analysis recently with the Piggy data set. There's a lack of, of age data and you know, for growth modeling, you really need to anchor your stand in time. So that's something that we do need to focus on addressing. We have a target of establishing all of our new plots by 2025. We've got 266 new plots that have been established to date, but we're short about 450 that need to be established over the next four years. And we also need a process for reporting and correcting data issues. So one of the things that um, we notice is, so the data flows from the company to into Piggy and then to an analyst who finds issues. And the reporting of those issues has to go all the way back to the company so that they can correct those issues in their source data and re-report it into Piggy. So we need to find a, a fairly efficient way of doing that. And lastly, we are considering whether or not we need to do some sort of compilation within the database to, to improve our validation rules. So compiling volume per hectare, once you put things on a per hectare basis, all of a sudden you start noticing some issues that you may have with, for example, with them. Um, the plot size you reported being incorrect or something like that. So there could be quite a bit of value in adding compilation routines into our database. And that would also potentially add value to any analyst using the data downstream because they would have, have access to some compiled data. So that was a little quick review of Piggy in a nutshell. Um, I just wanna acknowledge a few folks. So there was a core team that was involved in the inception of Piggy and I, I, I sort of think of them as the visionaries. We've had four retirements uh, since this, this, uh, this project was initiated. So I hope I've got everybody on the list here. But th there was a lot of visionary work in making sure that this was going to work. So I just want to acknowledge them. And then I'm trying to find a good word for Sharon. I put her in as either the engine or the maestro, but she held the process together, drove it forward, made sure that the, the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. So I think she deserves some acknowledgement as well. And Julia and myself were guinea pigs and I'm not giving myself acknowledgement, but want to acknowledge that there were some folks involved on the, on the leading edge that sort of tested out the technical implementation pieces. Want to thank the companies for providing the funding for those folks to be the guinea pigs for that process as well. So that's it for my piece. Um, feel free to give me uh, a call if you have any questions or get in touch with me. You can also get in touch with Brian at FGRO. And at this point, I'm going to hand things over to Logan. So we're just making the transition to our second presenter. So stand by. All right, thanks for that uh, great intro to the, um, yeah, what Piggy is and the database and such. And thanks to uh, Brian for inviting us to talk about this this week. For those of you that were on the um, presentation last week by Robert Froze, you would have noticed that his uh, presentation 
his research he talked about in his presentation used um, data from the Piggy database. So it is out there, it is being used, and um, we hope that it uh, continues to um, yeah, bring good high quality data that can lead to uh, high quality research and growth and yield modeling. So what I'm gonna do is gonna go over um, some more specifics of how the database works with like data loading validation and then some tools that have been developed to, I guess, like review the status of the database and assist companies in submitting their data and identifying issues with their data. So um, for just some brief stuff on data format. So um, there, there's basically eight CSV files that companies submit. And this is organized into a plot CSV file that just has general information on the permanent sample plot that wouldn't change throughout time, like its location, natural subregion, that type of stuff. And then a plot um, measurement CSV file that has more specific information on stuff collected at an individual measurement, like the, then yeah, two uh, different CSV files that holds the uh, information on trees, on the trees and tree measurements, a regeneration CSV file, and then um, one for uh, treatments for managed plots and disturbance events that might have led to, um, some damage or mortality in the plot, and then an ABI CSV file. So, um, and then that's all submitted through our um, ELANS website that we host at 4Corp. And what it does is it goes through a um, validation routine that it's a fairly complex validation routine that has several hundred different validation rules that it checks within the data. And um, some of these are like simple checks just to see if like individual fields are missing. And then some are more complex or relational checks. Like say, if you'd put a, that the stand's origin was planted, but that it was a natural stand that would generate a warning, or that if a DB, if a tree's diameter had decreased between measurements, that type of stuff would generate a warning. And then it spits out this um, large list of validation warnings, which I have on the screen right now. And um, it can seem a bit overwhelming because it'll pro for most companies it'll be a very long list just because with bigger um psp databases it's going to generate a lot of warnings typically so what i usually do anyways is just organize it into a pivot table and then it can be easier to sort through the ones that are more important or less important and the ones that can be fixed versus the ones that are um, more likely due to uh, just measurement protocols or I guess, valid warnings. So the, uh, the validation is kind of sorted into error warning and warning too. So errors are things that are, I guess, supposed to be incorrect and not allowed in the database. So anything that's an error won't actually be allowed to be submitted. And then um, they're also uh, organized into the warning and warning too, just as a, it's just kind of a somewhat subjective prioritization of which are the more important warnings to review and fix if possible versus the ones that are less important. So ones that are classified as um, warning are the ones that are considered to be like higher priority to fix um, just because they have generally, they, they're more likely to have caused potential issues in the data or cause potential issues for the modelers if um, they aren't corrected. And then warning two if uh, are just 
lower priority F items that might be more likely just due to um, differences in, um, like, say, certain fields weren't collected or um, obviously certain warnings can be um, valid too. So, and I'm going to jump over to this report. So, um, recently we uh, developed this um, like online HTML report to um, kind of, I guess, uh, as like a constant thing that would be updated to both um, summarize how the piggy targets are being met and then provide the individuals and companies that are submitted data with additional information to help them ad identify how well they're doing compared to other companies in meeting their targets and then help them identify any gaps and issues in their data that might be might have been missed during the validation or just are higher priority ones that they should check again if they didn't check it in the validation. And then um, some helpful graphics to help visualize outliers in the data. And then ultimately the goal is to provide modelers with higher quality data. So in the past, this type of reporting was just kind of done on either an ad hoc or annual basis. So um, the idea is by providing um, this as like a uh, constant one that's constantly updated, um, it'll, it can be more useful because it's generally live and can be updated anytime a company submits data and can be used to get some useful information at any given point in time, such as how many plots are in the database right now or when did a certain company last submit and such. And so the one I have today is just an abbreviated version of the uh, more detailed one we prepared for the piggy group. Um, so just to quickly go over some of the um, reporting and analysis methods. So Kat talked briefly about the uh, um, piggy targets and how the targets were allocated. So the two, um, Basically, there's a number of plots that are allocated by each company for natural and managed plots by stratum and natural subregion grouping. And so the uh, stratum of plots is determined by two potential methods, which is either the basal area of the most recent method of the most recent measurement or the density of the most recent measurement. And so, um, yeah, that's calculated by doing the um, broad cover group based on the uh, coniferous versus deciduous basal area and density. And then these following species groups are used to uh, determine the lead conifer so or i guess lead species so obviously all deciduous species um would go in within the aspen species group and the pine and larch species are within the pine species group black spruce is on its own and then white spruce um engelman spruce and fir species go within the white spruce species group then lead conifer is assigned based on the basal area or density of the uh, conifer species groups and then the final stratum is assigned using either the basal area method if the total basal area is more than 10 meters squared per hectare or the density method if it's less than 10 meters squared per hectare. And then for the actual stratum groupings that are used for um, determining the piggy targets. So for they're based on the government's base 10 strata and then just certain ones have been um, grouped to make just slightly fewer groups. So for natural plots, um, they're either in the pure deciduous um, to mixed wood groupings, depending on whether the 
leading conifer is pine or spruce, and then the pine, spruce, and black spruce um, groupings for pure conifer. And then for managed plots, um, similar, just there's more um, deciduous, or sorry, more mixed wood groupings. So two for the pine mixed woods, depending on whether deciduous is leading or conifer is leading, and then two for the um, spruce mixed woods, depending on whether they're deciduous leading or conifer leading. And then for the natural subregion groupings, so the alpine, montane, and subalpine are grouped into the Rocky Mountain region. Um, several of the uh, natural subregions way up in the northern end of the province are grouped into the boreal highlands region. Um, central mixed wood and dry mixed wood are grouped together. And then the northern mixed wood, lower foothills and upper foothills are on their own. And then any other natural subregion is grouped with other, though I don't believe there are any um, plots in the database at the moment in any of the other natural subregions. So I'll just jump over to a map on the next page. So just wanted to mainly use this to show um, the current coverage of plots we have in the database. So um, this right now you're just seeing all of the all of the plots currently in the database. And as you can see, we have quite a good, um, a fairly good spread across the province of plots from ones way down close to the U.S. border to all the way up to the very north end of the province close to the end, end of the OT border. And um, as you might expect, the area they're most concentrated along is generally along the edge of the Rocky Mountains and in the foothills region as those are some of the um, generally more productive forests in the province for uh, timber production. And um, yeah, if I just turn off natural plots, you can see we have managed plots all well across the province as well. Um, so what this, this first table is looking at, Kat mentioned some of these numbers briefly, but this just looks in a little bit more detail on um, how well we're meeting those um, piggy targets of a total of 900 plots, 900 natural plots, and 1,200 managed plots. So if we count the total number of plots submitted in the database, that's the um, data companies have to submit, as well as the um, voluntary data, they can submit on top of that. We're actually a fair amount above, or well above for uh, natural plots at the moment, and then um, just a bit above for managed plots. But as she mentioned, we're about, it, we're just counting the data companies have to submit. We're about 200 plots short for natural and um, and about 526 short for managed plots. And right now, the only um, natural subregion groupings were short in overall are just the Rocky Mountain, Central Mixed Wood, and um, Northern Mixed Wood for managed plots. But as you can see over here, um, there have been a fair number uh, of new plots established since the initiation of Piggy in 2014 in at least the uh, central mixed wood region, few, fewer in the Rocky Mountain and um, northern mixed wood. And then this next table just looks at the same thing except by uh, stratum instead. So same thing, we're well over the overall targets for natural plots when all the data in the database is considered, but um, under for most of them when only the mandatory data is um, considered except for the uh, spruce mixed wood. And then for natural plots um, seem to be short on the, uh, particularly the mixed wood pine, um, Managed stands and then the 
Pierce, Black Spruce, and White Spruce managed stands. Then this next one just looks at um, the number of plots by how many total measurements they have. So as Kat mentioned, we have up to a total of um, 10 measurements in an individual plot. So there's one plot managed plot that has 10 measurements in the database and then a fair number more that have nine and eight. And um, I guess this just shows that there are uh, plenty of plots out there being remeasured. And overall, it seems the highest number is around that for managed plots is around that two to three measurement um, number, just because a lot of these are newer and have been established more recently, whereas a lot of the natural plots tend to be older. So have more measurements so far. And then this just looks at how um, stratum changes between measurements. So I mentioned the overall plot stratum is assigned just based on the most recent measurement, but you could calculate it um, for any given measurement that has trees in it, essentially. And um, this generally follows the general I guess, knowledge of what we have with how um, succession tends to work in Alberta forest because if you look the most common transitions between stratum tend to be from deciduous dominated will go to the mixed wood strata and the mixed wood strata will go to the conifer dominated so if I look at the um hard the uh deciduous leading strata um, the most common transition, if it doesn't stay the same, is to the mixed wood spruce or from the mixed wood pine um, strata. The most common transition is to the pure pine or from the mixed wood spruce stratum. The most common transition is to the uh, spruce leading. And then generally the same thing is seen for uh, managed plots as well. And I'm just going to jump over to this um, data visual visualization page. So um, this was something new, somewhat new that we um, developed recently. And the general idea about it is to um, both help modelers and individual companies identify issues in their data that might just be easier to see if they look at it graphically and then also identify some that won't be, um, wouldn't be captured in the validation process. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, yeah, got this figure of the um, establishment year of plots in the database. So as Kat mentioned, we have one natural plots going back to the 1960s, which I think the initial ones were um, mostly Government of Alberta plots, and then some companies began to establish their own plots in the late 70s and early 1980s, and then um, managed stand plots began being established in the uh, early 1980s. And you can see um, a pretty significant drop-off here. I would imagine that drop off probably coincides with the um, economic recession in 2007 and 2008. Then this vertical line here just represents the year that um, Piggy was initiated. And you can see that there seems to be an increase in at least those first two years after Piggy was initiated. It goes back down again, but that just might, that could just be due to a bit of a lag between when companies. Um, are establishing and measuring their plots and submitting to their to the database. And then basically the same figure except by uh, measurement year. And again, you can see there seems to be a bit of an uptick um, in measurements those first few years after Piggy was initiated. Um, I'm just gonna skip a few of these because I'm running a bit low on time and I want to get to the more interesting ones. Um, so this figure here just shows the um, density, uh, the 
average um, tree diameter on the left and then the density in stems per hectare on the uh, x-axis. So this is um, the idea between do behind doing some of these is it can identify issues that are not currently captured in the validation. So there's no compilation process in the current validation. And as you can see, there seems to be a general upper line of where plots are located and then some outliers here. So the likely reason for these outliers is an incorrect plot size entered. So if the company enters a plot size in the database that is smaller than the plot actually is, it'll cause the um, calculated density to be higher. And if I just go to this next one, which has some lines on it, um, you can see some pretty interesting things. So again, most plots seem to be in here, but then there's some weird plots like say, this one that's gone from a density of 500 stems per hectare way up to 10,000. And then the average DBH has dropped. So that would suggest there's probably something awry with the data in this plot. So um, we've provided these types of figures to um, on a per company basis. So what our hope is is that by showing these, say, if this company saw, um, yeah, saw that one of their plots does this, they might go and investigate further because this would not generate as a warning in the current um, Piggy database. And then this is just a company specific example. So I chose this company specifically because I'm, um, a bit more familiar with their data because through other work we've done. So it might look like if you look at the arrows, you would think, why is the average diameter um, decreasing and density increasing? Because that goes a little bit against the uh, conventional wisdom of the direction you'd think the stand should be growing. But in this case, this is a company that in their older measurements, they um, did not collect any sapling data, so they didn't. They weren't collecting any data from trees uh, above 1.3 meters tall to five, up to a five centimeter diameter, and then they started collecting it um, later on. So when those data get the sapling data start getting collected, suddenly it looks like there's a decrease in average diameter and an increase in density. But that more so has to do with a change in measurement protocol. And then this one's just an interesting, and again, a company specific one for um, managed plots. So you can see a lot of these seem to be starting at a lower density, probably closer to when the stand is initiated and they're planted. And then they kind of go towards that um, outer line of the density to um, the uh, diameter to density relationship and then start moving up along it as um, thinning takes place. And then another useful thing to vi visualize could be basal area over time. So it's just stand age on the x-axis and basal area on the y-axis. So see in general, most plots generally moving up or staying stable over time. And then you can see some that are going down. So um, the ones that are decreasing, you'd probably expect that there would have been some type of disturbance event, say mountain pine beetle or blow down or just natural mortality that's causing a decrease in um, density in a basal area. And then we also have some tables that are um, do some more specific checks on the data and these are generally things that are captured in the validation, but um, we wanted to, I guess, display more, um, more visually by company. So typically the company names would be on this left-hand side here, but I've just removed them for the purpose of this presentation. So um, one thing Kat mentioned is the lack of age data. So obviously, um, 
having age data is fair, tree age data is fairly important for um, modeling and calculating site index and such. So if we look where um, if we were to take, see which plots have at least one age tree from each of the defining species within the stratum, we're only at about 65% overall in the database. So um, that identifies a current gap and we were hoping the idea, I guess, by, behind showing this table is um, companies can see how well they're doing compared to others and companies that are lagging behind could maybe look into their protocols and see why um, they're, they don't have as good age data, for example. And then same thing on the right, just looks at more detailed um, whether or not the um, plots have a source of information to get the age from, whether that be from the tree age, from a harvest age, from the ABI, or from a stand initiating fire event. So overall, there's um, like 213 natural plots and then 17 managed plots that don't have any of those um, sorts of information to get age in the data. So that identifies a, an area we can improve on anyways. And then if you look at harvest treatments, um, it's important to have harvest treatments for uh, managed plots because it can uh, be used to calculate that stand age. And generally we wouldn't expect natural plots to have a harvest treatment. So the ones that do, this could identify um, potential uh, misclassification of stand within the database. Um, per, like perhaps it was actually a managed stand that's been misclassified as a natural. And then, yeah, I'm running a little low on time, so I might stop it there to um, allow for questions. But um, yeah, I guess the idea behind these is just allowing companies to maybe have a second opportunity to catch things that weren't classified, or sorry, that they didn't dig into enough, or maybe were missed in the validation process. And um, we're hoping that over time, this type of graphical interface anyways, will help uh, improve the overall database and ultimately provide better um, data to the modelers. So with that, I can turn it back over to Brian in the uh, question period.